I'm Brittany Lewis with Forbes Breaking News. The January 6th committee held its third public hearing on Thursday. Representative Pete Aguilar, who helmed this hearing, focused on the campaign to pressure Pence into overturning the election results. Greg Jacob, the former VP's chief counsel, testified before the committee during this latest hearing. Jacob revealed conversations he had with Trump-affiliated lawyer John Eastman. Jacob said that he asked Eastman if they could agree that attempting to overturn the election would be, quote, a terrible idea. There is no evidence of widespread voter fraud or cheating in the 2020 election. Here's more from Jacob's testimony. He told you, maybe this was in a later conversation, but he told you at some point that if, in fact, the issue ever got to the Supreme Court, his theory would lose 9-0, correct? The next morning, um, starting around 11 or 11.30, we met for an hour and a half to two hours. And in that meeting, um, I've already described the text, structure, history conversation, but we started walking through all of that. And I said, you know, so John, basically what you have is some text that may be a little bit ambiguous, but then nothing else that would support it, including the fact that nobody would ever want that to be the rule. Wouldn't we lose nine to nothing in the Supreme Court? And again, he initially started, well, maybe you'd only lose seven to two, but ultimately acknowledged that no, we would lose nine zero. No judge would support his argument. After his meeting with the Vice President, Donald Trump flew to Georgia for a rally in support of the Republican candidates in the United States Senate runoff. Even though the Vice President was, had been steadfast in resisting the President's pressure, President Trump continued to publicly pressure Vice President Pence in his Georgia speech. Rather than focusing exclusively on the Georgia Senate runoff, Trump turned his attention to Mike Pence. Here's what the president said during that rally in Georgia. Pence comes through for us, I have to tell you. I hope that our great vice president, our great vice president comes through for us. He's a great guy. Of course, if he doesn't come through, I won't like him quite as much. So the president had been told multiple times that the vice president could not affect the outcome of the election but he nonetheless publicly pressured Mike Pence to do exactly that by saying, quote, if he doesn't come through, I won't like him as much. Let's turn now to January 5th. Mr. Wood. Thank you. That morning, meaning January 5th, the president issued a tweet expressly stating that the vice president had the power to reject electors. Let's look at what the president wrote. Quote, the vice president has the power to reject fraudulently chosen electors. Mr. Jacob, you've already told us about your meeting with Dr. Eastman and the president on January 4th, and you briefly made reference to the meeting you had with Dr. Eastman the next day, January 5th. Can you tell us a little bit more about that meeting with Dr. Eastman on January 5th? For example, where was the meeting? Who was there? So at the conclusion of the meeting on the 4th, the president had asked that, um, that our office meet with uh, Mr. Eastman the next day to hear more about the positions he had expressed at that meeting. And the vice president indicated that um, sort of offered me up as his counsel uh, to fulfill that duty. So uh, we met in Mark Short's office in the executive office building um, across the way from the White House. Um, Dr. Eastman had a uh, court hearing by Zoom that morning, so it didn't start first thing, but rather started around 11. Um, and that meeting went for about an hour and a half, two hours. Uh, Chief of Staff Mark Short was uh, at that meeting most of the time. There were a few times that he uh, left. And essentially, it was an extended discussion. Um, what most surprised me about that meeting was that when Mr. Eastman came in, um, he said, I'm here to request that you reject the electors. So on the 4th, that had been the path that he had said, I'm not recommending that you do that. But on the 5th, he came in and 
um, expressly requested that. And I grabbed a notebook as I was heading into the meeting. Um, I didn't hear much new from him to record, but that was the first thing I recorded uh, in my notes was request that the VP reject. Just to be clear, you're saying that Dr. Eastman urged the vice president to adopt the very same approach that Dr. Eastman appeared to abandon in the Oval Office meeting with the president the day before. Is that correct? He had recommended against it the evening before, and then on the 5th came in, and I think it was probably his first words after introductions and as we sat down were, I'm here to request that you reject the electors in the disputed states. And you referenced a moment ago some handwritten notes, which you've provided to the select committee. I'd now like to show you those notes. Uh, as you can see, you wrote there at the top, the writing's a little bit faint in the copy, but you wrote, requesting VP reject. Does that accurately reflect what Dr. Eastman asked of you in your meeting on January 5th? Yes. And what was your reaction when Dr. Eastman said on January 5th that he was there to ask the Vice President of the United States to reject electors at the joint session of Congress? I was surprised because I had viewed it as sort of one of the key concessions that we had secured the night before from Mr. Eastman that, um, that he was not recommending that we do that. So what did you say to him? Well, as I indicated, to some extent, it simplified my task because the, um, there are more procedural complexities to the send it back to the state's point of view. And I actually had spent most of my evening the night before writing a memorandum to the vice president explaining um, all of the specific provisions of the Electoral Count Act that that plan would violate. Um, so instead, since he was uh, pushing the sort of robust unilateral power theory, I've already walked the committee through the discussions that we had. We, again, we, I started out with our points of commonality, uh, or what I thought were our points of commonality, were conservatives, we're small government people, we believe in originalism as the means that, by which we're gonna interpret this, and so we walked through the text, we walked through the history, and I, the committee has shown footage of Mr. Eastman on the stage on the 6th claiming that Jefferson supported his position in a historical example of Jefferson. In fact, he conceded in that meeting Jefferson did not at all support his position, that in the election of 1800, there had been some small technical defect with the certificate in Georgia. It was absolutely undisputed that Jefferson had won Georgia. Jefferson did not assert that he had any authority to reject electors. He did not assert that he had any authority to resolve any issue um, during the course of that. And so he acknowledged by the end uh, that there was no historical practice whatsoever that supported his position. He had initially tried to, to push examples of Jefferson and Adams. He ultimately acknowledged they did not work, as we've covered. He acknowledged it would lose 9-0 in the Supreme Court. He again tried to say, but I don't think the courts will get involved in this. Um, they'll invoke the political question doctrine, and so if the courts stay out of it, that will mean that we'll have the 10 days for the states to weigh in and resolve it, um, and then the, uh, you know, they'll, they'll send back the Trump slates of electors and the people will be able to accept that. And I expressed my vociferous disagreement with that point. I did not think that this was a political question. Um, among other things, if the courts did not step in to resolve this, there was nobody else to resolve it. You would be in a situation where you have a standoff between the President of the United States and counterfactually the Vice President of the United States saying that we've exercised authorities constitutionally we think we have, by which we have deemed ourselves the winners of the election. You would have an opposed House and Senate disagreeing with that. 
You would have state legislatures that, to that point, I mean, Republican leaders across those legislatures had put together, had put out statements, and we collected these for the vice president as well, that the people had spoken in their states and that they had no intention of reversing the outcome of the election. We did receive some signed letters that um, Mr. Eastman forwarded us by minorities of leaders in those states, but no state had any legislative house that indicated that it had any interest in it. So you would have had just a, an unprecedented uh, constitutional jump ball situation with that standoff. And as I expressed to him, that issue might well then have to be decided in the streets. Because if we can't work it out politically, we've already seen how charged up people are about this election. And so it would be a, a disastrous situation to be in. So I said, I think the courts will intervene. I do not see a commitment in the Constitution of the question whether the vice president has that authority to some other actor to resolve. There, there's arguments about whether Congress and the vice president jointly um, have a constitutional commitment to generally decide electoral vote issues. I, I don't think that they have any authority to object or reject them. I don't see it in the 12th Amendment, but nonetheless. Um, and I concluded by saying, John, in light of everything that we've discussed, can't you, we just both agree that this is a terrible idea? Um, and he couldn't quite bring himself to say yes to that, but he very clearly said, well, yeah, I see we're not going to be able to persuade you to do this. And that was how the meeting concluded.